Wait, I understand that um, the training drive that you did a month or so ago and the journal that you've been working on uh, uh, as a result of that has caused you to do some rethinking or thinking about the, the concept of, of self-interest as it relates to organizing, and I thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit today. Good. Just start talking. Huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Tom, I've been, you know, I've been doing some thinking about this. We've been organizing here with, in Arkansas for four and a half years, and it seems to me that some of the classic explanation for, your, for both why people join organizations and how organizations act themselves uh, aren't covered by some of the concepts that you hear a lot about. And one of the examples, of course, is self-interest. There's, uh, in my view, at least increasingly in my view, there's a too much stress and overemphasis on self-interest, which has tended to obscure some of the other motivations for action, which self-interest can't explain. What do you mean by, uh, well, what, what is, how has self-interest been defined traditionally by organizers? Or? Well, the classic notion of self-interest comes, obviously, from the Alinsky School of Organizing, which says that people act because of their own perception of the realization of self-interest in a situation. That because people think they can get something from an issue or from an organization, mm -hmm. they then join that organization. And that they analyze that self-interest versus the risk involved for their joining. Right. And decide that the self-interest factors weigh most heavy and thereby increase their activity or take action. Um, I'm not convinced that it isn't perhaps the other way around than when you actually look at it. There's a couple of things which become pieces of evidence and looking at another direction. And I don't know we have a substitute for self-interest, but I think self-interest is, is a useful tool in explaining some actions. Well, that's uh, a, it's been like the keystone of a, of a lot of the internal financing mechanisms of ACORN. Um, in terms of uh, discount systems and membership benefits, the idea that you get something for your dollar has is, is been a, you know, well, a key thread. Well, the classic definition of self-interest is, of course, economic. Um, but even when you look at the discount system, the motivations for the creation of the discount system was self-interest. But the participation in the, in the discount system has never been high. That's what true. explains the fact that people will pay up their dues, become extremely loyal ACORN members, and may, to this day, never have used a single discount. And so some of the reasons why people may consciously define their, their participation in it may, may have, in reality, very little to do with you know, why they actually do it, because, because they don't use those very things that they, that, that, that they define as being attractive to them. For one, one example, what we found in the Pico Drive was two things. One is that, contrary to a lot of ACORN organizers believe you can get discounts if you expect to get them. Yes. And secondly, that you can get people to use those discounts if you build an expectation that they will be used. In other words, it wasn't just simply self-interest that motivates someone to use a discount. It was that they were organized to use a, self, a, a discount, which is not self-interest. It has to do much more with the creation of expectation. And the more and more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that it's the creation of expectations in organizing which lead to involvement, activity, membership, and eventually to action, and not a simple assessment of what my self-interest is here versus what my self-interest is there. I'm not sure that people have that accurate a rational analysis of their own self-interest. That's interesting, uh, just relating it to like the benefit kind of system as well. I've always been puzzled in some ways by the by the phenomenal success of the Food Buyers Club because of the tremendous amount of effort and energy and work that goes in, not even just by people that that you know work in it and get more and more of a, a discount, but even actually the, the process of buying the food involves, uh, you know, if you were to weigh, you know, the amount of time involved in it and the whole process that, um, that there's something more involved there than just you know, dollar savings, that kind right. of stuff. That, you know, well, obviously, that you know, self-interest plays a role. Sure. I mean, it can't be so opposite and and you know, antithetical to someone's self-interest as to completely negate and discourage participation. There have to be some factors which can provide self-interest uh, motivations for activity. So, what do you want to look at today or talk about today? Is what are some of those other kinds of factors that? Yeah, along with self-interest, uh, you know, or maybe... Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure that self-interest isn't the reason for activity, but simply a rationale. Okay. That one says, rather than 
I act in order to act cooperatively with my fellows, or I act in order to fulfill myself, that one rationalizes your activity because of saving money or a number of other things, and stops once the decision is made to even realistically analyze whether your self-interest is being achieved. People in the Food Buyers Club, for example, I don't think consciously make it a decision every time they go down there whether or not they're saving 20% or 30% or 10%. For that matter, I think if we said to people, and this is a scary concept in some ways, if we said to people, you are saving money, to some degree, I don't think the participation in a food buyer's club would be all that much reduced, even if they weren't saving money. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even if the prices were higher. I, 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 but yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But let, let's look at self-interest. Or, well, were there some specific uh, occurrences in the, in the recent drive, in the training drive, that, 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 that prompted some of these uh, reflections, or what, what, what else? Well, there's, there's one little, little thing we did in the drive, I think, which shows the power of expectation, although it doesn't necessarily reduce the influence of self-interest. Um, at one point, after the first organizing committee, we had uh, very few people at the first organizing committee meeting, uh, two or three people. We hadn't really been able to draw any of the folks other than the Cottons who we'd talked to into that meeting. The, the five or six folks that were there, the Cottons had drawn from their neighbors, which meant the other 10 people who we had talked to and invited to the meeting hadn't come to that meeting. And we were in a position of having to establish uh, door knocking and the schedule for door knocking and agreements to sign the letter. And what we did was a classic example of creation of the expectations, where we set up on a piece of paper a schedule in which we printed out some of the names on that schedule as people who made commitments to door knock. And we then went to each individual in the building block process, gave them the assumption, inculcated the assumption, that they had been the only ones not present at the meeting, and didn't cast any doubt about the fact that we expected, and the rest of their neighbors and the people who were at the organizing committee meeting, expected that they would agree to sign the letter and that they would agree to door knock and that we were here simply to get what time was best for them and coordinate with the rest of the folks. Of all the 10 people or less, that I forget how many people, eight to 10 we talked to, um, that Steve and Meg talked to, not a single one replied any differently than they were expected to reply. It was a classic kind of psych thing. Every one of them agreed to sign the letter. Every one of them agreed to door knock. Every one of them put down a time that they were willing to door knock. Obviously, that didn't necessarily translate into what they actually did, but at the moment that the expectation was created, they fulfilled that expectation to the letter of, and the spirit of the organizing drive. Now, what that starts to say to me, and I don't know that it becomes all-encompassing enough, or that there's anything all-encompassing enough to replace the overemphasis on self-interest, but I think if we just took another tack and said, this is a list of some of the examples of either individual action or group action that aren't covered by classic notions of self-interest. There are a whole mess of them. Um, some are on the simplistic level that you and I were talking about on smoking. Why do people who read on every pack of cigarettes that smoking is dangerous to their health are barraged by public service announcements and media health scares about what smoking's going to do, how much cancer you're going to get, it's not a question of whether you're going to get it, uh, and everything else. People still decide to smoke, even though the, in any sort of rational assessment of self-interest, one would not smoke. People smoke. And in fact, the number of smokers has increased. Why is that? Why is that? Well, let's, let's, you know, let's think about that. I think it has to do with an acceptance of risk that people decide for one reason or another that they'll accept the yeah. risk of smoking so then right. rationalize that risk around other kinds of considerations. Which is not self right, which is not classically defined as self interest. No, I think people whether they feel it or not say they enjoy it. Okay, I'll call they're willing to accept the risk in an existential sense of their life and what it means to them. Right. And younger people, those kinds of self-identity sort of things, independence and, and classy looking and kinds of elements like that, I think they're into it as well. Yeah, it becomes status, it becomes rebellion. Um, I think there's still probably a lot of weight that says that 
children coming out of families that don't smoke tend to smoke more than children who come out of families who do smoke. I mean, it becomes part of an expression <coughs> against authority. I don't know. But the point is, it's not just self-interest, or self-interest as it would classically perceive, but say that something which abuses your health, drugs, drink, smoking, um, any number of things are not self-interest considerations, unless, if you follow uh, the Alinsky-style organizers, unless those are irrational. But I don't think they're irrational. I think that people do make decisions to take those risks. Violence, how is violence covered? Most participation in violence is not within the self-interest of any individual or how they see it. It is still a rational, it's not an irrational kind of an action to take. Um, I think a lot of people have, have made the mistake as organizers to say that because something is em emotional, therefore it's irrational. Mm -hmm. The opposite of emotional is, no, is non-emotional, it's not irrational. Uh, the opposite of emotional is not rational, I guess so that's what I'm saying. Um, the opposite of, irra of rational is irrational. The opposite of emotion is emotionlessness or whatever. Um, but that in considerations of, of individual and group violence have to do with not self-interest kinds of motivations, but other kinds of motivations. Um, I think there are a host of other examples. What explains why people participate in demonstrations? What explains why people pick it publicly? What explains why people in conflict situations choose to become arrested when that it is a rational choice about whether or not you do get arrested. Um, the self-interest kinds of considerations are overwhelmingly against getting arrested. Reduction of status, record, financial penalties, social uh, deviance, exclusion and alienation from the good society, any number of kinds of things that people accept as risk in that action. Um, and more and more, I'm not sure that self-interest as any kind of organized motivation ever exists. You made a kind of a, a startling statement to me earlier, and that was that you thought that it was probably not in the self-interest of any of our members to belong to ACORN. Um, any, what did you mean by that? Well, obviously I'm talking about self-interest as classically defined. I think it is in their interest as they see it, but it doesn't give them any economic rewards. It puts them in a radical uh, context that uh, disturbs their employers, their fellows, their friends. Many of them have to defend their participation in church and whatever else. I think part of what encourages membership in ACORN is the acceptance of risk, is the acceptance that one does set, do something which sets himself off or sets herself off from their fellows and therefore establishes some fulfillment in their own identity that part of what motivates organizational concerns, and it's not altruism, or not just the common good, but it does have something to do with, in the society, the mass-based society in which we live, people differentiating themselves as individuals through their action. So, so it's, a, it's the very riskiness of something like ACORN that makes it attractive to some people. Hmm, part of it is. All right, the question I would have is, it, does this, Go contrary to the concept of a, cons of, a, of, a, of a majority constituency or a mass-based organization. I mean, is, does this riskiness? Are we talking about like a, a self-selective process of, a, of a, a special kind of person, or are we talking about something that touches a lot of people? Well, just attractive to everybody. Riskiness. You know. I'm not, yeah, I think it's, it's a little dangerous if we try to substitute one for one to riskiness. Uh, okay. But I think there's probably, you know, on a, looking on a polar extreme, that there's one extreme that operates only according to self-interest, as classically defined. Some, you know, studies say that uh, people in either prison situations or in even factory situations who are the least developed as individuals operate more exclusively on self-interest than anybody else. On the other extreme, there are obviously those who radically set them off, set themselves off from their fellows, and therefore are willing to take risk, and those risks become the enhancement of self. Obviously, uh, what I'm saying is not that you switch this side for this side, mm -hmm. but there's some, there's some middle ground in here. And I think part of that middle ground is how you define the expectations, how you define either what the interest or what the risk is, 
and that reestablishes self-interest, not as a reason for all action, but as a rationale for some actions. I think it becomes still a useful organizing tool if it's understood in that context, but that those organizers who try to explain all actions, especially group actions, as motivated by self-interest, are analytically missing the whole boat because self-interest is bankrupt in that context. I think part of what it is, obviously, is not just the risk takers, but people, I think, as a majority consistency, have a great need to fulfill themselves more, and they aren't getting that now from the established or custom sources that they would find fulfillment. Church, work, family, school, um, any of those kinds of things. The other thing, the question obviously is not either or. If self-interest is over here and risk-taking is over here, part of what current organizing practice says is you try to move self-interest to be the majority constituency. I think part of the question for us has got to be how you use self-interest, but at the same time make the risk-taking, if you will, or the enhancement or fulfillment of self through external activity, which negates classic self-interest, become a majority kind of a principle. That if we face society today and say that it's reasonable to assume that, at least for low to moderate income people, there are all so many numbers in a row, that the question becomes how we force them as organizers, to realize themselves through organized activity as individuals by establishing themselves as larger than they are. And we've always said in ACORN that part of the motivation for why people join is in order to be bigger, be, to be part of something that's larger than themselves as a chance of changing, puts them in the newspaper, and establishes not their simple identity, but their identity as, as leaders, as members, as people different than their fellows. I think what we have to do is stress that more, not eliminating completely self-interest, but define that as their self-interest, at least in how we operate, and certainly not to try to give them self-interest as the explanation for all their activities, but it just doesn't cover enough of the range. So I don't know. How does that translate into specific kinds of uh, ways in which an organizer would operate, say, or uh, his role, or the way he relates to, to the constituency? Well, obviously, part of what I'm saying in terms of the organizer's role is that too many organizers have tended to kind of wait for self-interest to establish the motivations itself. And they see their role as organizers being simply to define what a Tom Hickey's self-interest is in joining the Pike East community organization. And I think what it means for organizers is that we assume the self-interest, even if we don't understand it, and what we then build is the expectation that a Tom Hickey and Tom Hickey's then join ACORN and then participate in action. And what we don't let fall at all is that expectation in this creation. I think that's part of what it means, is that and it has to do with the whole orientation of how we think as organizers. If we think that it's reasonable to assume that given issues in the neighborhood or issues in the state or the lack of power that people have or anything else, that it's natural for people to join organizations for missing the entire boat. Organizations are, na are, are not natural kinds of entities, but artificial ones. People have to make artificial, not natural choices about joining an organization. If people feel a problem, it would be natural if they acted on it. When they decide because of external influence, i.e. organizer coming to the neighborhood, to build an organization outside of themselves, which is another external kind of fulfillment, then they're already in a position deciding opposite what their classic self-interest would have been. Can you take a, like, can you concretize this in some way, either take a, a a very delimited kind of neighborhood issue or a major campaign or, and, uh, and and see how approaches might differ? Yeah. Well, to some degree, I think already ACORN, in terms of how it's done a lot of campaigns, has gone based on expectation rather than self-interest. Um, the quorum court campaign and how it originated, the whole concept we have of building political power, I think has a lot to do with the expectations that if assumingly we live in a democracy, then the second assumption is that low to moderate income people who are the majority of that democracy should have power. They don't have power. Therefore, there are things that we do, quorum court, APAC activity, whatever else, 
which we expect that people would be willing to do, and which to some degree people, despite their own initial expectations, come to realize as being parts of individual or group activity. At the same time, you know, how we how we approach the classic kinds of issues is we keep trying to say that in a neighborhood, a stop sign issue or a drainage issue or all those kinds of things are what causes organization. Those things are tools that build organization. But it's not the quality of the issue so much is what amount of dreams and expectations we invest in the issue and get people to invest. And it has to do with a very simple fact is you compare our leadership with our organizing staff. Uh, you sometimes said that the, the uh, dreams and expectations of the, of the leadership and memberships sometimes exceed that of the staff. What do you yeah, mean Yeah, well, it's just, you know, it becomes really popular for organizers to overinvest in the cynicism around them. And therefore, when the leadership is saying, well, we'll take over the state in two years, or we'll go around the country, and, you know, as long ago as three years ago, Harold Medlock and Gloria Wilson were composing songs about <laughs> organizing the 50th state, when not even myself is willing to own that anywhere but with our leadership, and certainly not with our staff. It's a very simple kind of a thing, is that we've created through one victory after another in ACORN an expectation within our membership that the level to our accomplishments organizationally isn't limited. Therefore, why shouldn't that be a possibility? And the question is whether or not we also believe that that's a realistic expectation, is that we can organize the state, or we can organize the country, or we can create an AFL-CIO of America kind of a thing with the Association of Community Organizations, or that we can realize tremendous social change. And it's what we feel, and then what we communicate to those expectations, and what our membership comes to believe by watching the concrete successes, which changes the orientation towards our organizing. <coughs> People don't join because of no lousy stop sign three blocks over. They don't join because they've been flooded for 10 years. These are long existing problems. If they were natural and lead to natural action, they would have already been acted on to some degree. Would you, would you trade the, uh, the staff's uh, sort of cautious kind of uh, approach to the uh, membership's uh, optimistic kind of uh, dreaming kind of approach, uh, you know, would you trade it for that or would you try to have some convergence between the two and if so, how would you, how would you, uh, or do you understand the question? The dreamers have to lead, okay. you know, and that's, that's the trade. The, the organization has to be motivated by the dream, but it's important. You know, the convergence is that you can't get it just by dreaming. All right. and obviously, you have to fill in the straight. Um, the, the leadership obviously wants to have on every hand a royal flush. The staff knows damn well that you've got to have the cards to have it. And I think what becomes important is that the, the dialectic pressure that continues to exist between the staff's expectations and the leadership's expectations. And those things obviously fall to some degree on what concrete achievements are reached. Is that, you know, you know as an organizer when the quorum court thing was won. The membership viewed it one way, we viewed it another way. Analytically, the quote unquote thing, despite being a tremendous organizational accomplishment, was just another accomplishment. And a day later, it hadn't changed anybody's thinking on the staff or anything else. I mean, it was just one event and a seriality of events. The membership, obviously, saw the quote unquote thing as fairly revolutionary for their experience. It was something we had expected, so it didn't give us the kind of fulfillment it should have. Once again, our goals increased in order to satisfy ourselves as organizers. And their goals then increased as well, because we help create those expectations. I mean, you know, it follows one after the other. As you look at a lot of, con a lot of items, that uh, as long as there are realistic, concrete events which provide the floor on which the dreams are built, then that's the convergence. And so the important thing for the staff is to realize is that it's not just a matter of whether or not the issue is sexy or isn't sexy. It's what you invest that issue with. That if we can approach a stop sign issue in, you know, South Broadway or the South Down or Pico or whatever neighborhood you want to make up, and make that as big an issue as possible, then it goes to a lot to do with the ACORN model in which we emphasize tremendously the importance of creating a happening in making that organization. So it's not a matter of just hitting the skills and the ABC and, you know, first mix well and then stir thoroughly. 
but it's a question in too many drives of whether or not that happening of the expectations, the excitement, the fury of activity, and the expected participation happened is what makes the drive, whatever the issues. You, you, you talked earlier before the taping about uh, a number of experiments and uh, studies that have been done to sort of lend some credence to this. I think that it might be appropriate to talk about them here. Well, you know, obviously neither you nor I are sophisticated psychologists, and what we go by is what we what we read on the street in terms of why a Bill Whipple does so and so, mm -hmm. or Steve McDonald, or a Mrs. Willis, or Mrs. McAllister. Uh, but if you look at some some kinds of work that has been done, you see a lot of examples that kind of give rise to this kind of thinking. And uh, one of them is obviously the the test in schools where they said to teachers, these are the students who will do well and these are the students who will do badly. And it didn't... They're just a random selection. Yeah, the experimenters knew that some of the ones they said would do well were dummies and some of the ones they said would do badly were, you know, smart kids. The teachers, though, you know, they expected the good ones to do well. What do you know? A year later, they did damn well. And the ones who expected to do badly, they did badly. In the Hawthorne experiments at Western Electric, they tried to induce every kind of self-interest stimuli to get increased production. No matter what they did, even including re taking away all the stimuli, they still got increased production because the people themselves saw themselves as special. And I think that's a heck of a lot of it, is whether or not we see it and then whether or not we translate that assumption that they are different, that they are special, and to be an ACORN member means that you are something else and then whether or not we create the expectation of accomplishment coming out of, of the uniqueness of the individuals we attract. Now, what's the dangerous parts of this? I mean, uh, there are two of them. One is that you build, obviously, within the majority of constituency, a fairly elitist concept of who are the people that you organize. Because um, we would then be building the expectations that if you are an ACOR member, you are part of an elite. And that elite are those people who act. I'm not sure that's so bad, yeah. but that's clearly mm -hmm. part of the part of the pudding. The other thing is whether or not uh, we don't fall into too much pseudo behavioralism, uh, where we're saying, you know, we can create this expectation, and then these people will make that expectation realized. Um, but I think what, what self-interest does is, is that it negates essential parts of humanity, that people do act on some risk, that people also act according to authority and what authority tells them to do. People act on expectation. The experiment you, were talk, you and I were talking about where they kept hitting up to 450 volts and 70% of the people hit the mother you know, right into 450 volts with the, the victim screaming and carrying on and you know, as close as you and I to them so they could see it and everything else. And they were expected to do the experiment. So they kept hitting the lever over and over again. Well, I think that we're not becoming just a part of that kind of a school. I think what we're talking about in terms of expectations is only that we expect the best rather than the worst out of what people are capable of. And I don't think we're putting ourselves as organizers in a position where we're just giving one carrot after another to prevent a stick or to get a result. But uh, certainly that's, that's where what we're talking about and where it will be criticized as opposed to where you criticize self-interest. Um, I just, I just think that too much of where Alinsky came from and, and over-investing in the concept of self-interest had to do with what his stimuli is. Um, and part of his, his stimuli was reacting to what was going on. Uh, social work mentality at the time, settlement houses, and predominance of the church. Those two things aren't competing factors for us now. His analysis of unions where the part of their activity was motivated by a concept of self-interest and direct economic issues, increasing wages, better working conditions, fewer hours. His experience in prisons, which always shows that the people who do best are those that are exclusively motivated by self-interest as opposed to those who rebel against their own self-interest. I have to stay there longer. Um, I think for us as organizers, there are other things to look at to explain why it is that people have actually done what they do. And there's a difference as well, and I think this will counterpoint some of the behavioral conditions that we're worried about, and what makes individual action on the one hand, and what makes group action on the other hand. And why don't we talk about that? <laughs>